right, everyone. Welcome back to the Long Lens Podcast. This is the podcast where I answer questions from my filmmaking community and just talk about filmmaking and YouTube. And oftentimes, I have guests on, and this is the first time that I have a guest in studio. And today's guest is my buddy, Jacob Bunn. What's up, Jacob? Howdy, howdy. So Jacob is a, I guess, I mean, I'll let you kind of like introduce yourself a little bit, but I like I know you as a like a wedding filmmaker and a YouTuber. I think we met like four years ago and you were doing, you were doing wedding videos, I think back then mostly, but I know that you do kind of a lot of stuff. Like, so why don't you just give it like a little bit of a rundown of what you've been doing recently? Yeah. So I feel like I am right now in a spot where I'm doing a bunch of different videos, trying to figure out like where I want to go for the future, but mainly weddings has been what's worked for me. Basically out of high school, I picked up weddings, did one for my mom's friend and realized, oh, like people really like this pretty quick, just doing a short little edit, which, you know, going further back, make YouTube videos that were dumb little skits with my cousin and kind of taught you all the basics of editing. But yeah, so I did the weddings for like six years now, but a wide variety of like kind of do like some local ads. So like I've done some wineries, some real estate stuff, but trying to get more into fun, like passion projects. So I've been doing a lot more sports videography now. Just filmed the Fiesta Bowl that the Oregon Ducks played in. That's like the coolest thing I've done. So, and then like short films here and there I'm trying to do more of. So. Cool. Yeah. And you're, you're kind of into acting a little bit too, right? Sort of. I like, I don't have any acting talent or like try, but like I've weirdly kind of been looped into, like I've been doing stand-in stuff. So, you know, they put me in the frame for the shot and these are on like, you know, actual pretty big budget movies here in Oregon. Cause like I'm used to working with 20 bucks in a camera, you yeah, know, yeah. but like it's, um, Oregon kind of has its own little film scene. And so originally just went on the site to be a extra background in like 2019 ish. And you know, got a few responses here and there to be, you know, high school student number 90 or something, yeah. you know, nothing big. And then last summer I got one to be a stand-in on like a sci-fi, uh, kind of Stranger Things type thing set in the 80s. Okay. And it was super cool because they have you on, you know, the full 24-day shoot and you get to see like, you know, the directors working, you see like the actors, you're standing in for specific actors and that was really cool because, I mean, you're seeing every aspect of lighting. You're making connections in different departments. So, like, I get asked that even on the sets. They'll be like, oh, are you, like, trying to act? And I'm yeah, like, yeah. not really. But, like, <laughs> I mean, sure. Yeah, yeah. I did one in December that was called The Policeman. And they, like, threw me in, like, the main guy kind of acting. And it was like, oh, we need, like, a line chef in the background or something. So, you don't really see, like, you probably see my arm setting yeah, yeah, the yeah. thing. But it was still cool. So That's awesome. Do you get to meet, like, do you get to make any connections with, like, cinematography? or DPs or something like that? Yeah, so the hard part is like these DPs are just like, a lot of them are out of state. So they're in like California. Um, and one of them, uh, his name's Dan, and he was a really, really good DP on, it's called Onyx the Fortuitous. And it went to Sundance, I think. Oh, wow. And it was it was really good. And it did like kind of release nationwide, but just at like Regal, it was like a one day thing. So yeah. me and my girlfriend went and saw it. But, you know, he was really nice to where like I asked him, because it was nice being stand-in compared to like an extra. An extra, they hold him off in a separate area. They're like, hey, don't talk to anybody. We'll bring you in, bring you out, done. Where uh, with the stand-in, it's like, you know, you're just interacting so much. So I was like, Hey, do you have any tips on how to become a DP and like what you did? What was your route? And, you know, he tells me about kind of like this filmmaker magazine that he always looked at and then like the school he went to and kind of just making stuff constantly. Um, so like those connections didn't come like super well, like it was really nice talking to the director and, you know, somebody that's pretty established, but a lot of the connections are like production assistants and other people, you know, working at a similar level as me on their own films or their scripting or one of them, my friend Alex, he had his like horror film was in Portland's horror film festival is like a pretty big one and was in the McMinnville film festival and won quite a bit of stuff. So like, it's just cool other people around that normally it's like, I feel like one of the biggest struggles is like finding other people to make stuff with. And that was one of the nice things with you is like YouTube was a way to be like, oh, I know where he's at. <laughs> like that's Oregon. I recognize that. And so it's been nice. And it's, you know, the connections are really cool. I felt like I met really good people. 
but it's still like figuring out what you want to be in because it's very like different departments when it comes to that so you have like the electrical group like one of the guys was like hey if you want to like slum it with us you can come learn this <laughs> and i'm like that sounds sweet <laughs> yeah but then there's like the camera department and you know they have like a first ac second ac like all these different things and i'm like i don't know what all the specifics are they're doing with like you know you have different like lens handlers and like yeah it's just a lot more than just go pick up your lens and put it on and so it's definitely interesting seeing like that real world of filmmaking i don't know how to describe yeah that's always kind of strange because like i've always like i kind of wonder does that kind of help you figure out if you were going to go into like the the more traditional like filmmaking industry does that kind of like help you figure out like what you do and don't want to do because i know for myself everyone assumes that like you know like i want to be a feature film director or something like that it's like i never have wanted (laughs) to do that you know what i mean i just like making pretty images cinematographer maybe but like i don't want to be a director i can't write to save my life you know what i mean same so so it's like i figured out through trial and error what i don't want to do but i wonder like is being on like actual sets like does it help you kind of figure out like if you were going to you know try to go into that industry does it kind of help you figure out what you actually like i think so like i mean it's hard because I've tried to take in so much I see and like I'll bring a notebook with me and just kind of write like, oh, like, you know, the DP is going this 12 hour day and he's doing everything nonstop. The director is a little bit more loose and it depends on the movie. Like the policeman one, like the director of that one was just kind of, he had helped with other projects of the actor, which was kind of like a bigger actor. And he basically got him the directing job. So it was like a lot more controlled, it felt like. But back to like what you were saying is like, I feel I wanted to be a DP is how I've always viewed it. Like director sounds amazing, but seeing it, it's kind of like, it seems difficult to like balance all those different hats. And so like on these type of sets, they'll have first assistant director, which is usually someone pretty like local in Oregon, who's kind of like, I'd say the top person in Oregon, at least on set. And then they'll have like a second AD or, you know, a second, second AD, even though I don't know why they don't say third, but um, so like I could see... You know, right now, the way I view it is like, okay, maybe become a production assistant, just help out with moving stuff around the set, dealing with extras, like some of the PAs just kind of sign in the extras, make sure they go to the right place, just to be around the films more and get that perspective of like, oh, I really like these camera operators, or I like the props department, like that's super cool. But it's every movie I've been on, it's one guy with his like one assistant. So I don't know if you monopolize all of Oregon. (laughs) But another thing with that is like, I haven't seen like the scripting or the writing, like I haven't seen any of that on the high end because that's what I struggle with the most. And I'm like, I need to get better at this and I don't see it on set. Like it's like I'm seeing they have this finished project, they have script supervisors, people looking for continuity and just going. So it's it's definitely a helpful perspective, but I feel like I'm pulled like 10 different ways right now trying to figure it out. Well, it's cool. I mean, it's cool that you get the opportunities to do stuff like that. I don't know, that might be a good stepping stone and like a good networking area too, if nothing else, you know? Yeah. Well, and I was trying to like, I was supposed to be on a movie this month and it was supposed to be like three weeks out on the coast, but it's like, it's a pretty fickle like industry, especially when you're not an important role, yeah. just putting it as what it is yeah. like being standing. It's like, they could get any dude to stand in there. Exactly. And like, you know, sometimes they want somebody who looks a lot more similar to the actor. And, you know, like there was like a misunderstanding there where like, I was told like, oh, you're going to be the stand in on this. I'm like, sweet, this is great. Like, I don't have to worry about looking for other gigs. Cause you know, doing it full time, I'm thinking like, Hey, line up more weddings for the season. Don't find weddings, find editing work, find, you know, real estate if I need to, like whatever it is to keep it afloat. But it's like, if you expect money coming in for a role like that, you know, consistent work, it's just a little rough being like, Oh, you know, your position isn't a skill that's needed. So that's where I want to become something like, you know, even a PA is just a little bit more needed because it's like, hey, like they've done this before and I PA'd a little bit on a friend's movie, but then it's like moving up to being in a department or something. So it's consistent and then you can kind of wing off the other one. So Okay, so you you do stand in work. Does that like, I'm guessing that doesn't pay like crazy good, right? But it kind of gives you a little bit of leeway to... I guess, like, you know, work on passion projects or try to expand your portfolio a little bit while you're doing it. Yeah, because it, like, it's not great. Like, it varies between movies. Like, I talked to one person where Stanton was making, like, 26 an hour or something, and then wow. they were paying, like, overtime. Where, like, That's insane. the one I was on, I think, was, like, 18 an hour. So, like, I mean, that's you know, it's, still okay. it's, pretty good. It's better than being down at, like, McDonald's or Dude, something, that's, you know? Yeah, and, I mean, like, you know, I didn't want to just, like, kind of give up on the dream of things, even when, like, things are tighter, or if, like, you know, I've had a bit of burnout with the wedding 
quitting. So I'm like, do I want to keep doing this or do I, you know, take something else on while keeping that going? And so this was like the perfect storm of like moving further in a different direction of film. You know, even if it's entry level, it's like you're making some money. They do a lot of overtime and it was cool. And so I'm, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that there's just going to be more movies and people around this area say there is but it seems like you know the strikes everybody was just done you know you have people doing PA work full time movie to movie but then they were just off for two months and luckily like seems like people are making a decent living to where you know some of them were traveling I saw like one lady went to Peru or something I'm like that's cool and then came back when the movies were back but it's definitely interesting but like I was grateful to be getting paid to just watch them make a movie because standing it's like you sit over here in the corner and then they bring you in. So I feel like that's something that's definitely like, I don't know. It's something that I guess I miss out on a lot being a YouTuber. Is that like, there isn't necessarily a lot of community with being a YouTuber per se. There's obviously been, you know, opportunities for me to meet new people. I mean, you, I met you through YouTube. I guess that's a good tip is that like, just get into like the industry, even on like a really, really low level, either a stand in or a PA. And you can like network that way too, while getting to watch people do what they do, which is kind of cool. Yeah. I feel like you have like so much understanding of a lot of those aspects though, like more than I would of like more technical aspects with the camera that like it might be a lot easier if say like you or somebody in your position with like a lot of filmmaking knowledge just wanted to go into the camera department it might be a lot quicker of a route it's one of those things where I don't even know if that's like my like future trajectory is like oh do I want to just stick to traditional film because some of these movies people are on they don't like like I've heard some of these movies where the set environment was terrible like they had a really bad director or you know whatever it is and you don't have that choice of doing what you want or making what you want so that's where I feel like I want to keep you know both routes open but speaking of camera department so so Jacob actually reached out to me I think back in 2020 and I had actually seen his videos because you made these videos with a Canon 60D and even back in 2020 that was kind of an ancient camera back then even and I think that's kind of where you and me kind of like saw eye to eyes that like I was I think I was still using a GH3 back in those days and you were using a 60D and you were making videos on how like the 60D is still working for you. And I was, you know, making a bunch of videos with the GH3. Can you kind of talk about like, like your viewpoint on cameras is very similar to mine where it's just like camera is not necessarily the most important part to you. It's more just like what you're actually putting in front of it and what you're trying to create. What's kind of been like your journey as you've, you know, you've been on actual film sets now and you, you book clients with, I think you're shooting with an ADD now, right? Yeah. So it's still like, I mean, that's not the highest end thing. Like, I mean, it's still limited in a lot of ways, but yeah, for me, I kind of, I've always viewed it as like, whatever you have to make a video, a movie, take a photo. Like it hasn't always been just like go out and buy the nicest camera. Like it's like my mom originally had that 60D and was like, Hey, like getting into photography and stuff and want to try this out. I'm like, yeah, sure. And then, you know, YouTube is a big one for me where it's just like, I was watching stuff on like, what lens do I use to make this look good? Why does this look like crap with the little, you know, 18 to 55. And it's like, you know, even simple things like a variable ND filter to make that 18 to 55 just not as crappy in bad lighting or like, you know, too harsh a lighting. But I just always viewed it as like, hey, this is like the tool I got to do what I want to do. So it's like, there isn't another option of just like, oh, go buy another one. I was working at a movie theater when I was 16 and I was like, okay, like I saved up some money, but I don't want to be working all the time just to buy the next piece of gear and then working all the time to be buy the next piece of gear and then I'm not going out and shooting with it. So like, I really valued that time of like 16 to 19, 20 even because I would just go out and like, you know, drive my car to some random viewpoint because Oregon, luckily, like you go out to the coast, it's an hour and a half, you know, going to Portland, you got some cool stuff to film and just grab different things. And I'd kind of like, you know, I always liked YouTube and always thought like, man, how do I make this work? Like, this is the dream. And so I think seeing that first like reaction of like, somebody actually resonating with like, oh, I have that camera. This is cool. And I think when I made the first video, I was just like, what can I do that like other people will be interested in where it's not so much like just about me because I made plenty of videos about, you know, what I like and things. It's something where like, all right, like what's a little bit of value I can bring to someone? What's a struggle I had? Like, okay, let's try. And the first 60D video I did is out of focus. Like I'm pretty (laughs) sure you go back and it's like, you know, there's the actual filmmakers or people, you know, that understand cameras and are like, dude, this guy doesn't even know what he's talking about. But also there was a ton of people that were at that same level as me where it's like, oh, like mine looks like that. So at least like we're in the same boat. But yeah, and then like now it's to the point where I'm just like slowly kind of, you know, I've built up a lot. Like lenses, I think is just one of the hugest things of like, you know, the main lens I use is the 
Sigma like 17 to 50 you suggested yeah. and like I love that lens and it's, yeah, like, it's a sharp lens for how cheap it is yeah and then big one I got uh was like a 70 to 200 for weddings just that real close up on you know dances and stuff but yeah. just having like solid lenses to back up the cameras it's like I bought other things that are not gimmicks but like my gimbal I use like very rarely like some shots it's been really worth it but like, I mean, I think the last time I used it was with you and like, it was perfect for that, yeah, um, the skating stuff. But, you know, I think a lot of people are wrapped up in the gear and I think we both view it the same way that it's like <laughs> a decent camera body that's going to get the job done and then just like a good lens. And then a lot of it's just like messing around. I feel like just actually being out there shooting something's the most important because yeah. I don't know, I feel like even since like, I think it was even earlier than 2020 when we met. Now that I think about it, because I moved over to Virginia around then, I feel like I've seen your videos like improve a ton over the years just because like you've made so many. Like that's yeah, well, a big that's, difference. Yeah, that's the thing that like I, you know, I talk about a lot on my podcast is that like it's nice looking back on your work that you did and seeing how bad it was and just like seeing how much you can progress in that short amount of time. I feel like I'd be kind of bummed if like my videos looked very similar to how they looked back. And I mean, dude, 2019, I had still like a decade of using cameras under my belt. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I just feel like I've, that was like, I knew so little back then. And I know that like in two years, I'm going to look back at the stuff I do now. And it's like, man, I didn't know anything. Yeah. It's going to be like, I can't believe I did that. Like didn't do that one thing to every video. Yeah, like, exactly. I, yeah. I feel like that was me with, I don't know, just like the early stuff I would film was so shaky it's like why didn't i just like either just use a tripod or like any sort of like camera strap hold it close to you know yeah. be balanced or you know just even throw stabilization on the footage it was like what am i doing <laughs> like and for context just in case anyone wants to know like something that like me and a jacob worked on recently all of the s5 or at least two at least two of the s5 2x videos that i did for panasonic all the behind the scenes was Jake with his ADD. So that just gives you a little bit of a taste of like, his ADD, I mean, I guess you can tell a little bit that maybe it's not as sharp as the S5-2X sure. footage, but like, I don't think that like, it was such a jarring difference that those videos did really, really well. Like, yeah. like it's not like, I don't think I saw one comment like, why is the behind the scenes footage not look as good? It's like, nobody really cares. Yeah, you're already invested too. Cause yeah. like what you're making is like, people are into it. You know, yeah. they're already like established, like, oh, this is good. That was one of the things with the 60D where like, I'll go back now to like from the 80D to the 60D and I'll notice like that sharpness is like, whoa, like how was I doing this on some weddings? Cause there'll be times where I've had Carly, my girlfriend, like wants to kind of get into it. So I had her yeah. film a wedding. So I had her take my 80D and then I rented her like a backup 80D. And then I had uh, my 60D and then like another 80D. But like, so that was my other angle. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, this is like zoomed in even on a 70 to 200. It doesn't look like, you know, there's just like the yeah. edge is just feathered or something. It's just, you can work around that and make it work. Like, you know, I think I lowered my aperture just so like, it was just the image isn't as, you know, much bokeh, but it was yeah. like, all right, like it's crisper, but. Yeah. I think that there's something to be said too about like audience expectation, you know, most bride and grooms probably can't tell the difference between like an 80 D and a 90 D, especially if they're watching it on YouTube. And that's kind of what I always have them back in my mind. Like, even if like 8k becomes the new standard, my audience, I don't think that like the audience on YouTube, I don't think that their expectation is 8k. You know what I mean? Their expectation is just something that looks good enough to where it's going to look sharp on YouTube. <laughs> right. I mean, like it becomes a point where it's like, what's, I guess like improving is always better, but like, what's the point of like, if an image looks good and clean, like you've had people shooting on film forever that looks yeah. incredible. It's just like, I think that's something that people like neglect a lot too, is just what's in front of the camera. You know, like this studio isn't like the best looking studio ever, but I can guarantee you that it would look so much worse if it was all just like white walls and there was nothing in here, you know? Oh, like, yeah, there's so like, much to even just like the lighting setup. And yeah, like set so deck and things. just, like, you know, like lighting is so much more important than just the resolution of your sensor. And then lenses, I agree with you. Lenses are kind of what can make or break a good camera, you know? Like I'd rather have a GH5 with a good lens than a, a red Komodo with a really crappy lens. I noticed when I was shooting the Fiesta Bowl, I was like, a lot of the people around me that I'm shooting with are shooting on a lot nicer cameras. Like it's just what it is, but I'm like, 
am I just going to be like, oh, shoot, I don't have that. Like, I shouldn't even be here. Like, it's like, no, like, you got an opportunity just take it. And I was happy with a ton of the footage. Yeah, and it looked good. I mean, like, Thanks. like I'll be sure to link uh, Jake's Instagram so you can check out that Fiesta Bowl footage that he, like, made. But, like, it looked it looked really good, especially on Instagram. You can make, I mean, even 60D stuff will look good on Instagram, you know, like on a small little screen. Yeah. But, I mean, I watched it just recently, just before you got here, like, on your website. And I was like, That's, that still looks really good for, you know, for ADD footage. Like... <laughs> I'm definitely to the point where like I want to like because I want to keep furthering myself so it's like those limitations of a camera it's I don't want to ever be like oh like I'm not going to do something because of it but it's sometimes can be frustrating when you're shooting something you're like dang I could have got that shot if I'm shooting 120 frames or you know if that's a little bit crisper that's good or yeah. the autofocus but I'm going to make those steps to keep improving those things but Honestly, it's helped to sometimes be like, all right, how do I make this shot happen? How do I get something that's comparable or better to what somebody else is getting? Just because, you know, they can shoot it up high and have really clear, crisp footage. But like, oh, I have the better angle than them getting lower and to the right spot. So yeah. it's, you know, thinking of ways to try to compete, you know. Yeah, I am big on football. Like I filmed football for Old Dominion for like a year and a half. And that was really cool. You obviously know how to shoot it, though, because I mean, your stuff looks good. Well, I think it's just like you... There's so many people doing it now that it's like, I'd imagine if you were doing this 20, 30 years ago, it's like, oh, you'd really have to like trial and error to see like my first game wouldn't have been good. But like before my first game for Old Dominion, it's like go on YouTube, see how people are shooting it. Like I'd already followed people that were shooting it. And it's like there's tutorials on YouTube for that yeah. stuff. It's like that's before I went into it. It's like you see people posting stuff about like, oh, I shot this game for the Carolina Panthers in the NFL. I'm like. It's just weird that you're getting to see an inside view of that. So yeah. it's that definitely helped a lot. So what kind of work have you been doing besides your stand-in stuff? In 2024, are you looking to do more more weddings? Or you said you were getting a little bit burnt out. So like you just wanted to pick line of area of creative work to go into. Would it be like sports videography? Is that something that you're like you're pretty passionate about? I think so. I think the big passions that are kind of weighing on me is um, like the sports videography and then actual filmmaking. So you know, short film work to try to get into festivals to, you know, maybe get something funded. And I don't, that could be way harder than sports. I don't really know. You know, I got my first short film into a film festival this month, but it's like the McMinnville one I grew up with. So it's yeah. like, you know, that's super cool for me, but I don't know, like, I don't think that movie's capable of like festival to festival to festival, you know, just winning stuff to move up. But it was like a really cool experience. Like, oh, we made something that's in a film festival. So I think those two routes have always kind of pulled me from fully going into one and I think I want to fully commit to the sports like at least for a year or two be solidly with a team with a program so it's like a sense of consistency because I think a big part of freelance work filmmaking is like you don't have consistency and I made consistency with the weddings but then it's like is this what I want you know because it's like I'd always wondered a lot of people would be like oh like you do weddings that's like rough and like everybody would say that and I'm like yeah. why are they like saying this and then like over time you kind of realize just like if one thing goes bad it can just snowball like I'd had a really good experience for years and years and then it just became you know like you have one person who's unhappy and then like their friend you were referred to is like whoa I don't know and it's just like what what I know and that's I feel like there are some people that like they love doing weddings that they've been doing it their whole career and they still love doing it. And it's like, man, more power to you. But I don't know. I went through a season of shooting weddings. I have nothing but respect for wedding videographers because it is not an easy thing to do, at least especially, I don't know, for me, it just, I don't think that it came naturally. You see the money start coming in and it's like, oh, it's really hard to turn down that money if it's, you know, a consistent thing. I had to just kind of like let go because that just wasn't like the direction that I really wanted to go down. And that's what I'm really on. Like, I don't, like, I have never wanted to be somebody that, like, money runs my life. And I get, like, a ton of aspects. Like, that's how it has to be. Like, yeah. you know, you have to survive and yeah. things get more expensive now. Like, it's just been, like, even with the weddings. Like, I think I was doing some weddings at 1500 I'm like, this is sweet. I used to be charging 700 yeah. But then, like, everything went up. And it's like, oh, you're not making as much as you think. And some people are charging $3,000. i have dipped it higher before to where it's, like, 20, I think like 2300 is the highest I've done. And like, yeah. I was pretty happy with that doing like similar work, but I just don't want to be like caught up in like, oh, like just the money. Like I, I've even noticed growing the wedding business. It's like, oh, I haven't gone out as much. Like I haven't posted YouTube videos in a long time. Like I still go out here and there and like take my camera when me and my girlfriend go somewhere like a cool hike or something, but I'm yeah. realizing I'm not just going out 
with the like intent of creating something having you around is like a good pullback to like let's just go make something like let's do something like this like try some product stuff like i have another really good friend that pulls me back that same way in like actual like filmmaking so that's when i made the horror short film we did and you know he had his own script and concept so me and my cousin and him and like some other friends made that and i think sports is one where i could see hey like i'll be making consistent money but i'll be surrounded by like something i love year round like i really love football and you know it has a season so it's going to cut off but then there's time for those other things so i think that's the goal right now so like i've applied for some different jobs with like um kind of like football league that opened up so they like it's hard to describe but basically like two small football leagues merged together to be like anybody who fails in the nfl can basically go here seattle had a team so i filmed some stuff in the stands and i was talking to a player and i was like oh he tried to get me on the field to film and then they have their rules but anyway it's just like that's been how i viewed things like just try and talk to somebody like i just took my camera to that game and filmed them playing. And it's like, I sent it to someone who a player reposted it, who used to be in the NFL. Like you never know who's going to be like, Oh, like, will you come out and film some stuff? Cause like, I mean, that's how I met you is just sending a message like, Hey, this is really cool. Like that you're filming stuff around here. Like maybe it'll work out. The music video I did, it was like, you know, I originally met him from the 60 D video, which is kind of crazy. Like he's in Australia. Yeah. He like was like, Oh, I'm trying to shoot a music video with like my Canon 60 D. And like, I don't know how to even do anything. I tried to give him some tips and, And then like, you know, more and more conversations. It's like, I come to the U.S. every like few years for like vacation. Maybe you could like film something. I was like, sure. And became pretty good friends through that. So, yeah. I'm guessing that the editing process of like those sports videos that you've done is probably funner than the wedding stuff. Yeah, because I mean, it's just like sometimes you see one of those plays and you're like, oh, that was that was sick. Like the focus is perfect. I sometimes- And you even have like a song like, you know, going in your head sometimes too, yeah. I bet. Yeah, yeah. Now, as far as editing goes, Final Cut, Premiere? I'm really still, I'm stuck on Final Cut. Really? Like I, I really like it, yeah. but like I just know like if I was on Premiere, it would probably be a lot better for consistency. I'm guessing that's what you use a yeah. lot. Yeah, I use I use Premiere, but I almost, I don't know, I envy people that use Final Cut almost because here's the thing, especially as you start getting into like hiring cameras with really difficult codecs to work with, the more difficult codec, the more your computer matters so much. But I feel like with Final Cut, because it make like it actively makes proxies as you pull your files into there you never really notice if it's a beefy codec or not and you can do the same thing with premiere but it's not as streamlined so like i've seen people edit really really compressed 4k video that would like destroy like slow down my macbook but they're editing it on like a 2015 macbook pro with final cut just because it makes those active proxies so I'm just like, man, that is such a nice feature. Because I'm with Premiere, I feel like I'm constantly having to like upgrade. I'm in a 2019 MacBook Pro and I'm on the verge of buying like a maxed out M1 Max just because I'm gonna need it as the cameras that I start using get beefier and beefier, especially with H.265. Anyways, if I could go back and just learn one, I would probably rather learn either Resolve or like Final Cut because Premiere is in this really weird state where it's like, they can't redo the code because it was designed for, it wasn't really designed for like the new Apple, you know, chips or whatever. It's never going to be as fast as like Resolve or Final Cut. But it's just, I notice like a lot of people use it. It's the only reason why I'm like almost the opposite. And like, I've taken time to learn it. So like, I'm a very basic editor in Premiere where like Final Cut, I feel like, can mess around pretty well and do what I want to do. And yeah. DaVinci's one where like I've downloaded it, I've like put some stuff in and played with it, but it's like, man, I should really like learn this because there's yeah. something to be said of constantly learning those things to be able to, you know, push forward no matter what. Absolutely. And I kind of feel like, not to say that like, you know, Final Cut isn't, I mean, it's a pro system, it's a professional editing system, but I feel like when you look at like the interface, it's not as intimidating as something like, you know, DaVinci Resolve. Premiere is kind of like in the middle, but I do think that, yeah, Premiere has really good team project things, whereas even in Resolve, you can't, it's not as as good. And I really like Premiere's audio, like their AI audio editing is really good. Like I wanted to try that out because yeah. like I'll, I have it downloaded, but then like I go back and forth of like, if I like, I'll pay for it for a while. If I know yeah. I'm going to do a project with someone, otherwise I'm like, I'm not using this for months. So yeah. like this entire podcast I edit on Premiere and I just use like the podcast preset that they have and it sounds great. So, I mean, Final Cut, like I, I feel pretty good at like getting my color where I want it to look and being able to desaturate certain things and just like how I want to make it look like I'm like, 
I have it down pretty well, yeah. but it's also not like the proper way, I'm sure. Like it's just kind of what like I've picked up over time. Sure, some of those things are probably the proper right way. Like I know how to make sure like, you know, it's lit properly, like making sure my exposure level's at a good point, like bringing stuff up and down. Yeah. But then like when it comes to the actual color, like sometimes I'll just be like, oh, like I want to like isolate a color here, just desaturate this a ton. Yeah. And like, it's fun to try that out. But like, I do also want to have those standard things down because like, you know, working on a project together, that's super important. And yeah. I think it's easy to very much like do your own thing with this type of like YouTube filmmaking. And like, that's what I've done for a long time is just make stuff how I think like it looks cool and good. And, yeah. but I do think it would be good. Like, that's one thing that's impressive with your stuff is like, you know how to do things properly and take the time to like learn things and teach things properly. Where like, you know, sometimes for me, it's just like, oh, like I'm going to just try this and like, that looks good on the camera. Like, cool. And yeah. so it's definitely, I feel like a balance there, you know? Sure. The way that I've learned how to do it it's typically from people that have been doing it for a lot longer than me and I just copy what they do most of the time. Uh, what do I use? XCV, like X is my ripple delete, C is cut, and then V is my selection tool. So I can like, I can cut an entire, like I'll be able to cut this entire podcast down in like 20 minutes, you know, just doing that and just like, you know, cutting it all down the timeline. I think the last thing that I want to talk to you about is something that you've been doing a little bit more recently and that's product videos. But you did some, I think it was spec work, right? Like, or did uh, McMinimins uh, pay you to do those? Yeah, so originally I just picked a company. I was like, I really like this brand and I kind of picked somebody that I thought maybe there's a chance, like they don't have a ton of videography stuff. They have photographers for sure. But yeah. I was like, maybe there's a shot they'll like some of this. And so then I just went and picked up three different really cool design cans and was like, I'm just going to make something. And either it looks really good to send to, you know, a random tiny cider company in Oregon or, you know, it works out and they like it. And it worked pretty well, the timing. So I made three different videos, um, two ciders, and then one was like a Terminator Stout, so like a dark beer. And the timing worked out really well that it was like the 25th anniversary of that beer. And they were like, oh, we'd love to post that the day of. So then they went out of their way. And I think they posted all of them on like stories, but they yeah. specifically posted that one. And it got some pretty good like engagement. And Yeah, I saw it and I was like, because I saw you post it on Instagram. And then I saw McMinimins like <laughs> repost. I was like, dang, like did they commission him to do this? This is insane. This looks so good. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things where it's just, again, like, messaging. I was just like, hey, if you want to use this, feel free. And then, like, you know, sometimes you just check more. You're like, if they are responsive, they are talking back to you, just being like, hey, like, if you ever want any work, like, made for you, like, feel free to message me or, like, here's what I charge or not even going that far. And, like, you know, with theirs, it was like, oh, we have a specific, like, production team for stuff. I don't think McMinimins is really interested in video that much unless it's, like, an event is kind of what I've noticed, which is fine. It was, like, good for me, you know, being able to, like, a big thing my dad would always be like is, like, oh, get, like, a screenshot or a photo or something that, like, you made work that was posted by McMinimins or you made work that was posted by the Fiesta Bowl page because, like, you never know what like somebody else is going to be like, wow, that clicks for me. Like they did this. Cause like my friend who I did the music video for, he like hired his photographer based on the fact that uh, he had like filmed juice world before took in photos of juice world. And it's like, I knew kind of being able to put it together that like he attended the concert and brought his own camera and yeah. took those photos. But it's like, you just never know what's going to resonate for someone of like, Oh, I love that. So yeah. that's kind of like the power of doing spec work or just work that isn't, you know, necessarily that like you're not being paid for. You can still use that in your portfolio. You know, you can still say like, yeah, I shot this. Like it wasn't, you know, commissioned by McMinimins, but like they liked it and it looks good. And that was one of the reasons why I have Jake in the studio today is actually he's going to help me do some, some product stuff because that's something that I actually want to get better at too, is just shooting products. And I feel like you're already better at it than me because my product stuff is, doesn't look good. <laughs> at least in my opinion, it doesn't look as good as what you've done for McMinimins. So, cause you did one, I think where you even like did like some animations of like, it almost looked like a cartoon animation. Yeah, and that's one of those things where it's just kind of like cheating the shot. Because, yeah. like, I mean, I'm sure somebody has a real intensive way of, like, I'm going to go in and I'm going to draw, like, the eyelids. Because this can has, like, these little eyeballs on it. And, like, I'm sure somebody would do it the proper way. But I'm, like, pretty sure I could just zoom in on the top eyelid, cut that out with a mask, just copy and paste it over the layer. And then, you know, I just animate, like, a few frames of them going in and out so it looks like a blink. And then yeah. just paste that on all the eyeballs and you know, a few touch-ups here where you might like feather something so it hides it. But 
you know, I think that's part of the fun with the product stuff is like a lot of it can be pretty similar, but if you just do like something a little bit different, it's like, oh, that's really cool. Cause that was my favorite one. Cause yeah. I think I did like their charity, cherry cider, like spinning in and like, that was cool. It looks good, but it's pretty like, you know, traditional, just like product on a background, which like, I mean, it was also great. And frankly, like I think is what most of these companies want, yeah. but I really like a company like McMinimins where they have like a weird art on their can or, you know, like I'm going to do that book up here where like, I'm trying to, you know, the, it has flames on the side of the book. So I want to like backlight it and maybe like put in some flame assets and maybe it'll look like trash or maybe it'll look really good, you know? And like the nice thing is a lot of those, you, if you just shoot it nice on a black backdrop or, you know, whatever you want, like you can just, you know, push back, like not commit to that idea, but you can try it. So. Yeah. Cool, man. Hey, I really appreciate you being on the podcast. I guess the last thing I want to ask you, like if you could, cause I know a lot of the people that listen to this podcast, they're either trying to make a YouTube channel work or they're trying to make a freelance career work. If you could give like your younger self a piece of advice that you wish you knew earlier, like what would that be? I think it would just be staying committed to like trying things because I think it's very easy to just get caught up in like, this is what I'm doing now. Whether that means you're committing to trying one thing in a field or, you know, you get stuck in a job. Like I know I was fortunate that like I was able to do weddings and then like I'm technically in film for years, but I know it's easy to be, you know, working at a Walmart or something at McDonald's and it's just like, this is how I survive. And then your bills come up and you just, you know, keep doing something. I think just knowing to keep trying, like taking those weekend days and trying something out or, you know, for me, like I kind of fell off a little bit when I, committed to just doing the one thing with weddings. And then, you know, in my free time, I decided like, oh, you know, I moved to Virginia and I think I could have made some really cool videos or films there. But, you know, I decided to just have more fun, like have, you know, go out drinking with some friends. Like that's just what I decided. And I don't think it was wrong, but I think like I would be further along if I was like, hey, I have friends that want to go film stuff. Like I probably could have filmed stuff with those friends, but, you know, you made a decision that day to choose something different. So it's like, just still trying and taking like, you know, one day to become a little bit better. Cause all the opportunities I have is just from like asking people, I was like, Hey, like I've shot this. You think that's cool? Cool. Like, let's, <laughs> I mean, it's as simple as like doing this with you. It's like, I showed you like, Hey, like I make YouTube videos on random cameras and stuff. Yeah. It's like, it's cool. And you know, I got super lucky with the Fiesta Bowl. That guy, um, his name's Jeremy and he like, he puts on all of Arizona's big events and like, I'm pretty sure he did the Super Bowl the year before and I just found this wow. out and I'm like, he's somebody who's experienced and I just sent like a dumb message like, hey, do you need extra help for the Fiesta Bowl? And he's like, uh, I don't think we do. And I'm like, okay. And then like, he comes back and he's like, actually we do. And it's like, cool. Yeah. So Even now in my career, I'm just like, oh, maybe I shouldn't send that or whatever. Like maybe I shouldn't send that message or something like that. But like, it just goes to show that like, just, just like send the message. Like the worst they can say is no. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think yeah. that's something a lot of people get caught up on. It's like, how do people get into these things? Especially now, like I'm glad it's not a time where like we don't have a form of communication like that. Cause like yeah. it's been way easier to got the old dominion job, which was my first time in actual sports just by message, like sending a DM on Instagram. Like you don't have to have the right, like LinkedIn or like, mm -hmm you know, write info, phone calls, like, you know, I'm sure there's tons of people that have had success with that, but it's most of mine's been Instagram or like, you know, YouTube or Facebook or like just going out and meeting somebody because I was filming something. So yeah, yeah, I'd say like, just make sure you're still trying stuff and then not being afraid to ask is like a big one. I think that's just been the main reason I'm still doing this is because I have asked people like, hey, you want me to film your wedding? Cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. awesome. That's great advice. Well, hey, thanks, man. Yeah, I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Me. Thanks to everyone for tuning in to this episode of the Long Lens Podcast. Big thanks to my buddy, Jacob Bunn. I'll leave his Instagram and YouTube channels in the description and show notes below. But yeah, thanks for listening and watching. I'll catch you all next time. Later. <laughs>